My name is Yoon, and thank you for having me here. I've been really inspired by learning about what's happening here at the museum. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is we're going to actually do do some VTS so that we can talk about what it is. As, um, as uh, Peter was saying, VTS has been around since, well, the organization has been around since 1995, but it actually has a longer history. It started um, back in the days when my when one of the co-founders, Philip Yanowin, was at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And so I'll talk a little bit about that, a little brief history, but I, what I wanna do most importantly is give you an experience of what VTS is and think about what that means in this context of visual literacy. And I also know I talk really fast, so um, you could always tell me to slow down. And um, thank you for having me here as well. I'm just ending um, a multi-week time here working with different museums, both in Belgium in the Netherlands and in Ireland. So it's been a really exciting kind of time to see the different applications of VTS everywhere from um, medical, medical colleges um, all the way to working with um, neighborhood uh, galleries. And so it's been, this is a nice way to think about it kind of from a bigger perspective. Okay, here we go. All right, so really, I just really just from um, assuming that you don't know anything about BTS, when I talk about BTS, it is the name of a discussion based teaching and learning strategy. We use it in schools. We continue to be in museums and museums of all kinds. So currently, I've been working with science museums across the US. We work in universities and other institutions. Um, it is also a carefully designed art image curriculum that's used in schools. It is a multi-year professional development for schools and teachers, and it is grounded in 30 plus years of field-tested research, primarily the work of Abigail Hausen, who's a cognitive psychologist. So um, here we go. We're gonna do some VTS. Okay, before we start, we're gonna do VTS. I'm gonna stand over here, so I'll speak as loudly as I can. Um, I would love for you to participate. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands, just be yourselves, and then, after we do VTS, we'll talk about what we did and then some of, you know, we'll answer a bunch of questions and I'll talk more about the method. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is what uh, VTS session, what it looks like in an art museum, what it looks like in a medical um, context, what it looks like when we work with uh, corporate teams, what it looks like with kindergartners um, using public work, what it looks like when I'm working at an aquarium. So there, there is quite a wide range of context, but this is what it looks like. So let's take a quiet moment. Let's take a quiet moment and look at this image together. Okay. So um, what is going on in this picture? If you could raise your hand, that'd be great. What's going on here? Okay, so the first thing you notice kind of centrally in this picture is that there's a lot of people on a boat and it looks like it's sinking. And what do you see that makes you say it's sinking? Because the, the guy on the right is, uh, mm -hmm. with the bucket, is pulling out water. Yeah, so right, this person right here, he's kind of dumping that water out so that that boat is not sinking. So thank you. What more can you find? What more can you find here? Yeah. They are trying to catch some butterflies, I think. All right, so focusing our attention away from this figure, but more to this corner, we're noticing some butterflies and thinking they might be trying to catch them. What do you see that makes you say it looks like they're catching them? The, the guy with the jeans shirt this is one? Like it's really trying to catch one with his hands. Okay. And there's also one with the um, net. Um, yeah. Right here? Yeah. Okay, so honing in on just a couple figures here, it looks like he's stretching out to try to catch one. And then this person has a tool, a yeah. net, that also looks like um, the action is toward catching these butterflies. Okay, so we have some descriptions of three specific figures here. Okay, what more can we find? What more can we find? Yeah? Um, the man in orange is ocean. He takes a look off the IMDb, the Chinese ocean. <laughs> so this yeah. man right here? No, 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 no. Here. Yes. I'm sorry, this one? Yeah, ne next one. Sorry, you know what it was? I was looking at like my right and left. This this man right here? Yeah. You said he... he no, no, the one with the... 
something like that, oh, and yes, the other ones are singing right. along, yeah. because they look, don't look scary, okay. I think. All right, so a slightly different interpretation about the mouth, that perhaps instead of yelling, perhaps they're singing, and specifically honing in on this figure, that his gaze is upwards, that he might be, in fact, even joyful, um, and that they might be also just kind of sharing in some song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so yeah. a different interpretation about what could be happening with these figures. What more can we find? Due to the wreckage, uh, the stars would bounce uh, in, on the bottom. One might think they are in grave danger. Okay. And yet, they, uh, I do follow the idea that they're singing. They don't see it, that they're in danger. They're just happy chasing butterflies. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so a couple things. One is, um, as a viewer, we might be seeing something that they may not be seeing. So <coughs> noticing this detail here about what may have happened prior to the scene, that this might be evidence of an earlier wreckage. And you're saying, agreeing on um, your comment, that perhaps they're oblivious, that they may be singing because they're not actually um, aware of you, what could happen, okay? I would even go further, because if you yeah. look to the bow, it's towards the, the, the rocks. The way he's uh, rowing, is right it, uh, like he's, he's going towards the, the, the rocks, as I would say. Okay. And then, uh, Okay. Like I'm on a suicide mission. Okay, so <laughs> Almost. Upon closer examination of the direction of the boat and the way that this one person is paddling, they actually may be headed to the boat. You mean intentionally headed to the, I mean to the rocks? Perhaps. Okay. We don't know. Okay so, okay, so one possibility is that there is some intention about moving toward the rocks. So thinking about, are they aware that there's impending dis disaster? Do, are they aware and they're going into it? A um, couple interpretations also about the mood, about the response. Is it joyful? Is it singing? Or is it yelling, kind of like a panic situation? A couple ideas. What more can we find here? What more? Yeah? There's only one guy looking at us as a viewer, the guy with the yellow hat. Mm -hmm. This guy right here? The viewer is standing on the rocks, and the, the only one that is looking at us is the one with the yellow hat. Okay. And he's wondered on his face. So thank you. So more specifically, a figure that we haven't talked about, thinking about his gaze looks directed toward the viewer. So an awareness that, um, you know, what we don't see here is that there may be someone standing here like us and that he might be looking at us. So thinking more about the attention and where that is directed with each of these figures. Thank you. What more can we find? Well, I have the urge to go close and I thought it's I don't know whether it's a photo or a painting. Or a painting. Okay. And can I, can I just pause you there for a moment? So just as a viewer aware that we're looking at a reproduction, not a reproduction, um, what do you see that makes you say it could be a photo or a painting? What qualities are you looking at to, to uh, try and assess that? Well, I think judging from what it looks, it's someone who has looked at many Jericho or Caravaggio paintings. Okay. But yet there's something photorealistic about it. Okay. It makes me uncomfortable that I can't replace it. Okay. All right, so a couple things. Awareness that the, the maker of this, the artist, you're saying has an awareness coming from some reference points mm -hmm. um, of, of different artists. So thinking, is it the kind of the painterly quality um, of those artists? But also there's something that's photorealistic about this specific image. And so wondering, could it be a photograph? So both thinking about the painterly qualities, references, and styles of 
earlier painters, but also there's something photorealistic about that. So for you, having a little bit of that tension there. Okay. What more can we find? Yeah, hi. There's also something about the light because it's dark because you see a city full of lights. Back here? But in the same time, the, um, the guys on the boat, they yeah. are very enlightened. It's like there's a spot on, on them, but okay. only on them and not only on pirates and the sea. Okay. Okay, so now thinking about a different um, element here about light and about perhaps light source. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, you're interpreting this light back here as uh, lights coming from a city, from an urban um, environment. And then, but also noticing that there seems to be this kind of other spotlight that's here, that's a different source from here, and really focus on the figures and not outside of the figures. Okay, mm -hmm. so kind of curious about that and trying to evaluate based on light. Okay, what more can we find? What more can we find here? Yeah. The heads of the, the person in the boat, can you say they make a kind of circle? Mm -hmm. No, no, a more an oval, oval form. Like but this, the you mean? The, the, the viewer is guided in, in a cyclic. Okay. Cyclic. This form. way? Okay. Yeah. And you said because of the heads, where the heads are placed? Especially the heads are placed in, in So so think okay. Thank you. So thinking yeah. about the composition and just kind of isolate down to each figure's head, you have an awareness too of where your eyes are, are led because of that composition and noticing that it's kind of this mm -hmm. um, oval shape and that our eyes kind of move that way. Okay, thank you. What more can we find here? Take a couple more comments. What more? Okay. Um, there's something in the deck, something floating on the water with a light. Right here? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what it is or is it something that's the or okay, so seeing this other, uh, a new detail here, wondering what that could be and what role that could have in relation to what's happening here. Is it, is it uh, does that light indicate some sort of danger that it's trying to communicate something? So curious about what this one detail could be. Okay, thank you. What more can we find here? Yeah. Pointing out my story there, they are on a suicide mission because you're on the, on the wrong side of the, of the how you call it? Uh, oh, yeah. uh, the, 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 the on the wrong side of the light. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, so thinking about this as like kind of this uh, buoy that indicates where you're safe, yeah. that it, it indicates a sort of line, mm -hmm. a border about where you could be safe, where you might be safe and where you wouldn't be safe. And so going back to your earlier idea, yeah. kind of building back on that it's, it's a kind of suicide mission, that they're, they're aware of that danger zone that they're in, um, builds on this detail here, they're on the wrong side of that. Can I ask, what do you see that makes you say it's the wrong side of it? What do you see that makes you say if this indicates a border? What do you see that makes you say this is the wrong side? Because of the, that red, line? the red one is also uh, always on, 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 on the side of the coast. Okay. The so thank you for those of us who may not know how this <laughs> works. Um, assuming this is coast, and that the safe side would be between this marker and there, and that and we're seeing marker. this boat on the other side of that marker. Okay. So kind of giving more flesh to that idea of danger. Yeah, what more can we find? I don't think there is any relationship between the persons inside the bridge because they are all doing their own stuff. Okay. And they are not talking to each other. There is no communication on the Okay, um, and I think starting with that first comment, we noticed that there's a lot of figures on one boat. But for you, upon closer examination, you're saying, even though they share literally the same space, like they're literally <laughs> in the same boat, um, there's a lack of interaction between any of the figures that each of their um, actions, responses are, are isolated. Yes. Yeah? Okay, so thinking about the lack of kind of uh, interaction between the figures. Yes, what more can you find? I don't know, but from the beginning, that figure in the white with the hands joined Right here? Right? Yeah. It reminds me of the pose of the figure in the Angelus by Mie. Okay. And therefore, I'm wondering whether these figures are somehow um, lost souls. Okay. Okay. So, um, for you making a kind of a, I'm going to call text to text kind of connection, um, mm -hmm. I know that's like a very American classroom term, but thinking about how do we use what information we have or what inventory that we might have other 
text and thinking about can we figure out the meaning from here? And that's kind of what you're doing. And wondering if, uh, can you say more about uh, the other reference that you made? Well, I think there are a number. I mean, uh-huh. there's the there's the, the the raft paintings. There's the American one, the French one. Mm-hmm. I think there are historical references, quite a few of them here. Yeah. But just taking the point that they're not connected, mm-hmm. and that this said. man is crying out. He could be singing the Angelus. He could be. You know, I, so I'm reading, trying to see what's going on here. Yeah. And I'm just if I look at it in a multi-sensory way, mm-hmm. I think that. Um, but I think, well, I don't like where they're going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a few things you said. One is um, thinking about uh, what you know and what you've been exposed to and what inventory you have as you're scanning through of earlier pieces to help you understand that perhaps this is, it, they might be like lost souls, thinking about him. We talked about him perhaps being joyful. For you, it might be this kind of crying out to to. God, or you know, a, a more of a yearning that way. Um, and you're talking about how there are other conventions within art history that helps us think about some of these poses and these gazes as something that might be referencing what is happening at the art in the way that Bart, you're talking about more painterly styles of artists that this that this artist might be aware of. You're also thinking about some of those conventions. Um, well, these two guys are the, the only two people who seem to have seen something that's in the <laughs> same place. Right here. No, the guy on the left and the guy in the red jacket with the bucket. Yeah. They seem oh. to have seen the same thing. Right here? Yeah. And this guy? Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's something about their reactions that look like they are having an immediate response to something they both share, have seen. That's over here. Is that right? Okay, I'm going to take two more hands because there's so many hands between. Okay, what more can you find? Uh, well, um, bringing in art history, yeah. Brian, uh, then you suddenly get a whole different kind of possibilities. Okay. We thought about Jerry Crow already, of course, mm-hmm. but also uh, Bosch the Ship of Fools. Okay. Uh, which is uh, possibly, especially the person over there who is uh, captu- uh, capturing the butterfly with right the nets, which is a uh, direct reference. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, well, whoever made this, I don't know who made this, I'm oh. sorry for that, uh, but he made a very clever mix okay. of different art historical traditions. Okay. okay. And so for you, with someone who does have a deeper experience and knowledge of art history, that you're seeing them and you're seeing that this also is kind of a mashup of some of those references, not just one artist. You talk about Jericho, you talk about Ship of Fools, Rapparan, and Bosch, and this figure in particular Mm -hmm. seems to be in that same pose that you're um, remembering. Um, And so thinking also about the process of these artists who created this, about all the different kind of references and making a new kind of image and meaning that's happening here. And then last comment, what more can you find? You had your hand up. Uh, yes. There's uh, the, the guy with the rope. Yes. It's a loose end. So uh, <laughs> my, my expectation is that the ship is moving in, into the reading direction. Into this direction? Yeah. The butterflies go the opposite way. They're going that way? And okay. the, the paddle is dividing the group into two groups. Yeah. Right there. They are very strong. that divides the group? Okay, like right here. So if we read the physical um, or paddle um, and kind of take that line out, thinking about this image being divided into two halves, but also noticing that the motion are, so this part extends that way. If we think about, if we interpret that the butterflies are going that way, that the boat's going that way, that the, that the picture also um, moves in two different sections. That, that I get you right? Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to end the conversation here. Um, So let's talk about this. For those of you who are curious, this is um, a piece called Ship of Fools by a young contemporary artist named Carl Dopsey, based in San Francisco. Um, Anyway, anyway, let's talk about this. So what I just did was a VTS discussion of visual thinking strategies. Let's talk about what did I do? How was that for you? Just as viewers, as participants, what did we do just there? Seeing. Okay, so we had I had you talk about what you're seeing, right? What else? It's nice to share share with the with the other ones what you are seeing. Uh-huh. Because when I only have my own eyes, I yeah. Don't see what see. Okay, so kind of reflecting on the process for you as someone who both spoke and who had to listen, 
appreciating what you learned by really mining the group mind there. Okay, so it wasn't that we were just looking individually, but it's the cognitive process for yourself, but it's also a social cycle that's happening intentionally. This was not a one-on-one -on -one intervention, but a group one. So really taking, taking advantage of the peer group. Okay, what else is happening here? Yeah. Also that there were no right or wrongs. So okay. that you could share and that you mediated your responses and instead of saying, no, that's not right, that's not what is happening here. Yeah, okay, so, so um, different goals. So I wasn't here with a, a content agenda, per se, uh, an art history content. There's a lot of content that was generated, but I wasn't here for specific art history content. But um, because there were no right or wrong answers, the goals were really more about that slow looking, that kind of meaning making, and the listening. Okay, what else? What more? Do you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the answer came out of the knowledge which one has. Okay. Uh, on art or on, on a yeah. bit of sailing, yeah. <laughs> for example, or uh, how it works. Uh, old uh, uh, thinking in its own knowledge, I would say. Yeah, and so everyone brings, um, and this, you know, this touches upon all the kind of earlier um, presentations here, that we all have a different set of memories knowledge, and for me as a facilitator, I wasn't gonna privilege someone who has an art history background versus someone who may have no knowledge about art history but are coming with different kind of reference points and that they all have validity in this in this conversation. Okay, what more? Yeah? You were routine with the formulating and making sure that- I was trying. <laughs> well, yes, and yeah. that gave kind of the feeling that the message that I was trying to send was received mm -hmm. by you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So my role, um, one was to be neutral, right? So thinking about what, what was my job up there is to um, clarification, because so clearly I wasn't looking at the right person a few times. And so trying to get clarification, making sure that what you said was understood, uh, but also try to bring it back to the group so that's a little bit more organized. Because sometimes people talk and they're just thinking out loud, they're not giving me an edited version. Um, I was also trying hopefully to try to give some um, words to some critical language. I mean, really on a simple, <laughs> on a simple, simple um, level. Um, try to, I'm just trying to connect some comments as well. So try to map out the social um, process that's happening here. Okay, Brian? You felt like you were peeling an onion, you know, because <laughs> I, I don't think we were unguided. I think you started off with the very broad question of sort of what's, like going, on what's here? going on here. Yeah. And we ended up, you know, at the ship of tools, right? So yeah. we had peeled right into, yep. so it's a process. It's really yeah, it's a process that we want to thank you. So if you didn't hear it, Brian's comment was, it was kind of like peeling back layers of, onion, of an onion. Um, and that on one level, we started with just thinking about like, it's a group of people on the boat. And then we kind of went a whole bunch of places that got to some deeper meetings, some closer observations there. And it took the group and the facilitation method to get us there. All right, so, ooh, okay. So a little bit of history. Can I ask you a, another quick question? What are we, what's the point of this? Meaning, clearly I wasn't here to give you a lecture um, or a talk about this piece in particular. In fact, you probably have no idea what I know about this or, or what I think about it. So that wasn't my job here. What are we teaching when we do this session? And this is just one tool an educator has in whatever context they're working in. So this is just, so when you do this, why would you do this? What goals or objectives would this method support? Because it's not gonna support everything that you need to do as an educator, right? But what would it support? What are we teaching when we do this? Yeah. Learn, learn how to look and how to question, pose the right question. Okay, so you said look, learn how to look, Yeah. right? And okay. learn how to ask questions. How to ask questions. Okay. Yeah. How to listen. Thank you. And how to be okay with multiple viewpoints. I hope that kind of, that kind of, um, we talked a lot about this, this um, empathy, right? You may not agree that they're singing. You might think they're yelling. But for a moment, we're asking you to just literally just see where that person's coming from and be okay living in that gray, that it could be either or, and I'm not gonna give credence to one or the other as a facilitator. It's yeah. also empowering as a spectator that you then lecture us on this picture yeah. is about that, and we listen. Yeah. We have our input, mm -hmm. and we listen to that. Yeah. And we it was very um, 
group centered. So it wasn't about me. This thing was not about me. It was about the group. So what the museum is doing here, they're saying the art is important, but the people are important too. And so this is giving that kind of life to that value. So really brief history. Um, so really brief history is this is Philip and Abigail. I know they're not great photos. Um, and I know Brad, you've met Philip. So um, Philip was at the Museum of Modern Art in the 80s in New York, and Abigail is a cognitive psychologist. And she had been studying the way people think when they look at art. And so her stage theory is aesthetic development stage theory. And when Philip was at MoMA, this is when education departments were fairly new. Like it wasn't a thing. I know now you go to college and you can get a degree in museum studies. I mean, that's, that just wasn't a thing. Um, and so Philip was asked by his board, how effective are your programs? Like, what are you guys doing? Right? Philip was like, it's great. People come back, right? They're happy when they leave. It's filled to capacity. Our gallery guys, our curators have like rock star status. People love them, right? And he said, even as he answered that, he knew that wasn't really answering the question about how effective his programs were as an education department. And so um, a man named Howard Gardner, some of you might know him, um, wrote multiple intelligences. Um, he was on Phillips Education Board. He was also Abigail's thesis advisor at Harvard when she was working on her doctorate. And he said, you guys should meet. Maybe she can help you. And so she did a bunch of studies, right? Um, she, Abigail and her colleagues. And one of the studies we call the recall study, where after a um, typical gallery um, experience at MOBA, she and her colleagues asked people to just recall anything they remember from that talk. Okay. So keep in mind, people said they loved it, that they would come back. They thought the person who spoke was amazing, but they recalled very, 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 almost nothing, very little. What they did remember was very idiosyncratic, meaning not totally in context. They kind of remembered phrases here and there but it's as though they didn't even go to the talk. So for Philip and his colleagues, it was a, it was a real um, kind of depressing, <laughs> right? So for Philip, he says, what I, I, what I realized in that moment is that we were really good entertainers, but horrible educators, right? And so as educators, Abigail said, you know so much about your artwork, so much, but you know so little about how people learn. What tools do they already bring to the museum to look at art? So the short story or the very long story, that was the start of figuring out what program, method, protocol, um, could they build based on the research that she and her colleagues have been doing for years and think about how do we take advantage of what people do when they come to the museum? How do we build that kind of relationship for people and art so they're not spending so much time, more time in front of a label than they are the artwork. And we help them slow down and look, right? And so BTS really came out of that conversation, out of that work. Any questions about this? How do you relate yeah. um, visual thinking, which is what we've just done, right? Yeah. With the concepts around visual language. So, and can you just say more before I answer that so I understand what you're asking? Sure. So, um, BTS is a tremendously successful strategy, um, but it operates in an environment where it opens up the possibility of visual thinking for groups. Yeah. Um, despite the fact that, certainly I would contend, mm -hmm. um, our education system doesn't teach the basic vocabulary of visual yeah. language. Yeah, no, I agree. Does with that you. matter? Yeah, I, th I personally, I think it does. So, um, but it also depends, right? So BTS lives in a school setting quite a bit um, across the US and actually internationally, but, and so it's often used by people who don't have an art background and they might be using it for something else. So for example, we have lots of teachers who use it because it gives them um, a chance to practice giving evidence. So just saying, what do you see that makes you say that? And saying to a student, oh, so the evidence you're providing for your idea is, so that to them is the language that they want to really help promote in the museum. You have to have that other bucket filled with that critical language to be able to infuse it and really listen for when we're hearing it. It's about like that sticky moment, 
Do you know what I mean? It's because someone's wrapped in with that idea, you give them that word, and now they learn it differently, right? At the same time, it just kind of, again, depends on the context. So when I work with medical um, faculty at UCC, at University College Cork, so I'm in my fifth year working with them, they're using different kinds of language because they're really looking at those skills. Of how do you give, how do you um, make transparent how someone can read, let's say, an MRI film, right? How do you make a diagnosis? How do more expert doctors share that kind of expertise in a much more low stakes situation by looking at art? And so they're not necessarily using that same sort of art language, they're using other kinds of things. But again, a person who has an art background can bring that language, yeah. Are there questions about this before? I think my time is up, let me check. So let me just leave you with this. Okay, so this is a quote from Philip. He said, I've focused on a single goal, enabling people to connect to art in ways that are meaningful, lasting, and pleasurable to them. Part of the challenge for me was unlearning earlier teacher, teaching practices. I had to learn a new paradigm, one that put people ahead of art, one that focused on enabling, not just engaging people. I had to step back from what I thought people should learn to create a teaching learning method that would help them realize their full potential at any given moment. So my time is up. What I haven't touched on is a whole deep breadth of research that BTS was built on, which is Abigail's understanding of how people <coughs> make meaning when they look at art. <coughs> novice viewers, which most people are coming into a museum. And so, uh, next time. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I know we're closing up my session and then we'll have questions, but I think that's opening up.